I'm quoting Jack. Yeah, but that, but Stanley, isn't that uh, Jack's father said that? Yeah, father put paranoia in poor Jack's head. Did you did you think Jack? Think? The, beware the blacks and the Jews. Yeah, it was the father laid on the Jack that shit, man. And also, there was an article in Esquire, that article in 1970. Well, fathers do screw up, you know. But you want to know something? They tried in Hollywood to make a book of the sons of famous movie actors or the sons of famous writers, and they couldn't make it because there were none. <laughs> All right. You see, Monsieur Kowak, the father, was nowhere. The son was somewhere. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, I also did say, I didn't say it was exactly detrimental. I said that there's a kind of responsibility uh, people have. Now, I also injected this other idea, and of course this is not meant as any kind of accusation to Alan, really, that possibly some inaccuracies may seep in, you see. And let's face it, it all comes down to the idea that uh, was Jack, you know, bisexual or whatever, you see. This is what it comes to. Uh, and all I'm saying is that possibly the truth is still waiting to be discovered, you see. I think in the gay Again, sunshine interview... Without, without uh, in any way, yeah. you know, trying to um, question Alan's integrity, you see. No, all I, sa I said was that I made this, it with him. I didn't say he was bisexual. Say. This is a word but that you brought as, up. But as far as freedom to say what you want, of course I believe in it. Absolutely. God, I mean, God help us if we if we don't feel free to speak our minds in print anywhere, you see. But all I'm saying is that possibly there are people who are very close to Jack who may question the truth of this. Oh, you see, they think it's not true. Yeah, okay. That's that's <laughs> well, that's another matter. Yeah, but I, mean, I don't think Stella doesn't think it's true, because she told me some stories that were pretty yeah. funny. But it's true, I don't know Jack, that Alan blew Jack. I mean, that's true. What, what are you talking we about? We got witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wasn't there. It's huh? dead again. Oh, no, not Frank, go ahead. The dead is Frank alive. Calipigenous, Calipigenous. Calipigenous, huh? Calipigenous. Go ahead. Calipigenous. Yeah. How, many think, how many people you think know Question Calipigenous? Question coming you and I from know. the audience. You and I know it. Do they know it? Uh, Tell I them. The Question. Fuck, I'm answering that Calipigenous. How does Carol Wax draw a for They interrupt me all the time. All the time. What is the question? Uh, Raymond Weaver read Kerouac's first manuscript, The Sea is My Brother, in 1944, and gave him a slip of paper on which was written, look up Plotinus, the Egyptian Gnostics, or t t gave him a little reading list. Weaver having been the great Melville expert who discovered the manuscript of Billy Budd, a, a man who was like a very great man and a, a sort of Buddhist oriented. Uh, Kerouac then went out and read in and out of the reading list, which was mostly Gnostics, Gnostic, Western Gnostic material. He f later found his own place more in Buddhist Gnostic material than Western, though in his later life he went to Christian Gnostic. No, I don't remember that, no. It was simply that the image of the sea as my brother, uh, it, uh, Weaver saw through that manuscript to Jack's great spiritual depth and, and tried to lay out on him the, his predecessors in the West. <coughs> Go ahead. Sir. I want to ask a question. I believe it was uh, Mr. Ginsburg that brought up something that isn't so much literary as political in my mind. You referred to Kerouac's uh, admiration for Joseph McCarthy. Yes. Of uh, both universes and an inclusion of both universes in consciousness. Jarvis, would you think Jack would ever ask his father, Daddy, suck my asshole? You think he would have asked his father that? Never. I did, my father. <laughs> and what did my father say, Al? I'll consider he, it. He whacked you, that's what he did. <laughs> he wrapped him, he should have wrapped you. What the heck? 
Did he? I mean, I suck girls' he, assholes. I suck mine. Hey, what the Gregory, heck? Gregory, did he hit you after that when you? No asked? way. He should have. Oh, come. That's no. That's where you hit right. your wars. No, That's I'm where just you kidding. Uh, he wasn't in a position to. You should have worked for the. I suck girls' assholes. I suck mine. That's where it works. All right, look, man. That's your bag. What is it? Question? All I'm saying, all I'm saying is that Jack wow. Kerouac, hey. and you agree with me, hey, would never ask that, that, would never ask that of his daddy, because Jack came from a different environment. Well, well I'm the only man that asked a father to suck my ass off. Well, you're brave. And my father sharp says, I'll consider a smoking a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, Kerouac and Corso have that a similar, a similar social ploy. Which is saying things to irritate people. Of course, that's Jack. <laughs> that's Kerouac. As a method of testing out their reality testing. Right. Of no, course. no, but as a method also of testing out their humor and their own self-control. Yeah, but he look at you. Humor, not drug so You testing. wouldn't get angry with him. No, of humor. testing their humor and self-control. Oh, right. Humor is the. He never got mad at anybody. Well, yes, he did. Re no, he did not very for very long. I mean, he'd look at you and smile after he'd say something to you. That was rather negative. You know, he'd reach out to you. You want well, to hurt that? Jack. Jack. <laughs> uh, I found uh, I found out at one point how to I deal with it. He was I constantly laying on me that I was a Jew. Oh, too much. Who's that? Or that I was a communist and I was an intellectual and I was a creep and all that. Oh, sure. So on the phone, until I said, and I would get mad and start arguing with him about it until I suddenly realized he was playing with me. So I finally answered, "Why go fuck your mother?" And, and she yeah. shut up immediately and went on to a normal conversation as soon as I laid it back on him. Alan, did, is it true that the last time you went to visit uh, Jack that you were turned away? Uh, yeah, his mother was, had had a stroke and uh, he, to he called us on, uh, we called, we spoke on the phone and we were coming back from Harvard, I think. For, uh, for, I think we are reading at Harvard and we're going to drop by Hyannis. Peter was driving. And... Um, stopped by the house. It was late at night when we got there. He'd invited us to come, but then he changed his mind and he couldn't face the occasion. That's all. So we said go away or didn't answer the door. That was all. Well, why, why, did normal, he, you know? why was it that suddenly, and uh, John Holmes mentions this, uh, suddenly he was so lonely and separated from everybody at the end of his life uh, when, when perhaps uh, he needed his friends the most? Well, he didn't know he was going to die. What? I think alcohol no, he's took gonna over. Die. I think alcohol finally took over, and uh, it, it wasn't Jack. Jack wasn't there yeah. anymore. It's just like. Um, uh, it was a human being plus chemicals. Alcohol. It was all that uh, alcohol that was uh, uh, propelling him on. It, it, it was, it was, he always just, wanted to die. He right. wanted to I mean, it, when a man push everyone drinking, away so he could drink all day and night. He always wanted to die anyway. He always said, "I want to be safe, dead in heaven." But like, isn't that the time when perhaps you safe you should be heaven, uh, closest right. to him? If a man is sick, yeah, but you see, we, he wouldn't let us come. He wouldn't let us. His mother called the mother said to call well, the police when me we came house. down. I, they were about to call the police, etc. Right. But he let Gregory in the house. I don't, Why? Uh, Jay, Greg I, was don't think he was, I don't think he was really that lonely in his later years. I mean, when he came back to Lowell, uh, he married Stella Sampas, and of course, the family really embraced him. Yeah. The Sampas yes. family. The family was very good. He he knew that they loved him and. Uh, he wasn't completely lonely or isolated. I don't think he felt that abandoned. Uh, of course, uh, his other friends uh, right here. Oh, Jarvis, I'm happy that. about life, Jarvis. I've known the most beautiful people, even in prison. Before I met Alan and Jack Kowak and John and now you and Eric and everybody here, all the shot, beautiful. I better handle life pretty good from now on. I'm beginning to realize they're all beauties and nice. John, John Holmes, did, did it, do you not write in the Playboy article that Stella said to you at the funeral, where were you when, when he needed you? Yeah, well, admit that I gave you the title. Could, could you? I mean, that seems to contradict what... Uh, well, I Alice gave him the said. title for that What did she article. mean when she said, said... What did she mean by I that? I think she meant just exactly what she said. Jack had been sick. Jack had been lonely. This was in Florida, not in Lowell. Yeah. Right. Right. moved to Florida. Uh, this was two days after his death. She was understandably distraught. We suddenly appeared there on the scene, and she felt that maybe we could have done something. I don't can know. anybody describe his death? I can. And I wasn't there, but I heard it. Year, right. All right, all right, his death was, he went into the bathroom, he started bleeding. He had a rupture in his gut. He started vomiting blood. And Stella says, get an ambulance. And Jack said, no, 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 leave me alone. Right, Tony? Yeah, he was uh, coughing up blood. Right. Pow, pow, pow. You got a question there, Jay. You have a question. Uh, some comment on Jack Kerouac's existential problem. Uh, it seems to me that this usually derives from an existential problem. 
Business of Gerard, the business of what? Existential. Cody? Existential. Existential. Elements. Elements. Elements of existential. Yeah. Oh, the man against the shop is this man. I, I'll, I'll bequeath it to him. I bequeath this. Okay, well, I have a difficulty in not we knowing... talk so much, I bequeath it. Uh, not, in not knowing precisely what, uh, how you're using the word existential. So if you'll right, give me some information there, then I'll try to tally it. Yes. Oh yeah, I answered that earlier. I said if you have a choice between two things, you can't decide, take both. I mean, remember, no, no, both. Not one, he uh, made I, both. He varied. Well, first of all, there's that aspect of negative right. capability. That's both. That's the sharp shot, man. I wish I don't know if I'm going to tell you. Uh, uh, um, Pound or Elliot said of Henry James that he had a mind so fine exactly. that no idea could violate it. Do you remember? <laughs> hey, you know what we're forgetting out? Look at these babies with their long hair and their beards. That's a Monsieur Kerouac did. He was not. Yeah. Aaron, do you want to say something? Oh, no. Well, well, Kerouac. Kerouac was, went up to... Uh, Kerouac went up to Old Saybrook one time to, to see John Holmes. He was thinking of buying a, a house up there. And the conversation, this is all documented in, in John's journals, but the, the conversation turned to existentialism. And Kerouac kind of looked up blankly and said, would you uh, explain existentialism to me? I never can quite get it right. So, uh, I mean, in terms of any, he wasn't really intellectually an existentialist, I don't think by any means. But the... To a certain extent, the heroes, especially Neil Cassidy that he chose to write about, I mean, <clears throat> Sartre could not have thought of a better existential character than Neil Cassidy, who just wandered into Kerouac's life. Uh, so he gravitated toward people who, as he said, uh, as they're beginning to go west and on the road, Kerouac says that they were about to begin their one and only really moral, of their undertaking their one and only really moral duty, which was to move. I mean, and that's existentialism I mean, there's no choice you just go but it, I mean it wasn't an intellectual thing as much as it was just the way Cassidy yeah. among others taught him to live hey Eric you want some information but you don't know about and Alan can prove this now all here and I'll give it to the whole audience in 1950 when I met Alan I went to San Francisco and I wrote Alan a letter from Oakland Alan wrote to Jack Kerouac and Neil Cassidy when they started on the road. I said, meet this man who I met, Gregorio Nuncio Corso. Jack said, no, no, I'm going to stick with the man I'm going to write about. Remember, Alan? That's we didn't meet then, right? I remember, writing, I remember writing and say, saying you should all meet there. Right. And Jack said, no, he'll stick with this guy. Yeah, man, they might have had even a weirder trip. <laughs> John, All right. John, so a year later, I met him, 1951. Did you want to comment on that, Mr. Holmes? Yeah, just the, I don't think that issues or uh, ideas in that sense were ever real to Jack. Uh, they weren't at least as real to him as anything that was palpably there. <clears throat> and this is very ex this is the basis of existentialism anyway. Uh, so that they, he became irritated with, with high-flown talk and things like that. But. Uh, <clears throat> I believe he was one of the most intelligent men of his time uh, in the real sense, in the only sense that, that really makes any difference, in that he responded to anything that was vivid, anything that was alive, <coughs> and responded openly. This also refers to the McCarthy colloquy of a moment yeah. ago and many other things. This is why he was politically ambivalent, uh, <coughs> because politics was never real to him. But, there was a but, but, but humanly, he responded all, always in a human way to things. I remember something that people were irritated with in the 50s. He wrote a column in, in Escapade insisting on what he called human justice for the man Khrushchev who had been made to stand in the sun at the National Airport in Washington while a, while a parade went by. And Khrushchev was an old man. Uh, and this led many people to think that, that Kerouac was a leftist. He just saw Khrushchev on television standing sweating in the sun and uh, he thought that was awful. In other words, he, he sort of comments on the human condition more than any kind of uh, rationalization of the human condition. Yeah. Evelyn Teague has a question. 
I would like to make a statement, if I may, just a minute, please. I, uh, go ahead. Uh, I think uh, Kerouac's later writing is, is, is very boring, and it's, it's boring because he drunk. He dr drunk uh, and smoked continually. Um, I think his uh, political ideas, his whole life stuff, his whole life energy, things that he did from day to day, was from alcohol and liquor. And if in discussion, if you have any classes or uh, if he has at all studied in the colleges and the universities and high school, the, uh, his name like almost has to, what follows his name is, uh, is like alcohol, wine, liquor, booze, beer, cigarettes and tobacco and coughing and spitting. Uh, if, if it's not, you really won't understand Kerouac, and you'll probably make the same That's why I've been unhappy on this made. planet, because I have to hear that and shit all the time. I'm in here to take most, your planet. If most of you are from this area <laughs> and have any kind of uh, love for Kerouac and uh, his love for his sound, if you don't learn from his uh, experience, from his mistakes of drinking too much and smoking too much and too much sex, you are going to... Uh, I'm going to still die. You come like him and die very young and prematurely. He's still going to go. <laughs> I mean, Wait, you cut is the branch that might have grown full straight. Keats did his beautiful cargo. It's just like you have given Corso $500 oh, to I'm smoke. Gonna be, Alan says now, on my birthday. How long, how, long how long will the money that you have given him last? Wait, wait, how long? The money that he is getting from this symposium, this poetry reading. If I'll I'm give you the answer. How long would it last I'll when he's going to Peter. smoke continually and drink continually and take drugs? I'll give you the answer. Would, well, you folks are giving him that money. This money comes from your pocket for your He's going to give the answer. Well, in the future... Then it sucks, because it's not future, what I'm going to do. You also will be given you money. You want the answer or not? In the future, you You're folks also... You're asking me what I'm going to do. In the future, you folks also will be given money to come up here You're and speak. You're a pain in the ass when he talks, he you talks too long. You think you can talk and make jokes and laugh like he does. I tell you what I'm going to do fast. You folks, you folks think that he's a great poet and is saying a lot of funny things, and you are laughing to Peter, him. But you are actually going along and saying, fine, Gregory, go ahead and smoke and drink yourself to death. Just like you would say of Kerouac if he were here now, go ahead, Kerouac, we like to sit here, watch you drink and smoke yourself to death. And you are going so far as even to help give him $500 to do it. Peter, so shows you how really Peter, and stupid you people are. Pietro. Pietro, they're all going to live realize, themselves a death. You don't realize that. You're going to spend hours and hours and years of your life reading Kerouac, and it's sooner or later it's going to lead to booze and sex. Hey, and Pietro. And you're wasting your time listening to words that are going to evaporate because they... Pietro, the poet tells you that you and everybody's going to live themselves to death. Question, uh, Evelyn? Go ahead. Ah. Uh, Woman, thank God. Somebody asked me a question. Yeah, the I Ching, I know it. Any mysteries, I know. All of it. I know how the Neanderthal man came about. I know how the missing link came about. Okay, oh, ask me the question. Right, good God. Ah, that's hilarious. The question is... Ask it. Oh, come on. I love you. Man. Listen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Marlon Fox is Arlene Lee. When I came out of prison, I met Ginsburg, and Ginsburg introduced me to Kerouac and Holmes and uh, Burroughs, right? All right, this beautiful black chick wrestling with me, and they were all so serious because they were writing about it, and I wasn't. I fucked her. Jack thought I was, he put me as a sharp man and thought I did a bad turn by bawling his chick. What happens is years later, all the girls I have I offer to Jack, and they don't want him, they want me. So it never worked out. See, so it was all fucked up all the way, but I offered it, how dare a man offer a woman to another man? See, that's why I put myself on the spot. And why shouldn't I ball, anybody wants to ball me? He was too moralistic. That's what the Catholicism does. If Catholicism fucks you up, it always does. <laughs> and Pietro, I wanted to tell you something. Something real true, Peter. Well, I think you? Uh, Jack really loved the blacks, like he said, that he often wrote about them. Right. He would have went down to the south and lived with a black old grandmother. 
or a black old. Uh, oh, yeah, because there's no female where, here. It was that black chick. I don't chick, think Jack Ar really Ar did Ar love the blacks. He loved them in bars. He loved to sit and watch them play musicians, uh, the musicians play, and he loved them in bars where he could drink and smoke. But when it came to really loving the blacks and going down like, um, uh, who's the, the great radical that went down? Uh, well, Rennie, among others. R Rennie Davis and... Uh, uh, Rennie uh, Davis, uh, I found that he's running at Rennie that fourteen-year-old groom. Rennie Davis and the other one. Man, that Rennie Davis is going the at the fourteen-year-old groom. Alan, Can you imagine? Alan, the one that just came back from Hanoi. Yeah, hi, <laughs> yeah, Hayden, uh, Tom Hayden. Uh, Tom, they are examples of uh, of young men that went down to the South, trying to help poor black families. Whereas uh, Jack. Uh, uh, it was just, uh, uh, he, everything he did was to smoke it so he could drink it, get some more wine. It was true, in San Francisco when he was writing his uh, Mexico City Blues, it was just writing it so, the, so that he could buy more wine and cigarettes. And that's the kind of prose story that I don't you think are going to learn. You are going to learn as you read Kerouac year after year that he wrote so that he could buy wine and hard liquor and cigarettes. And that's what you're going to learn. All this discussion of Kerouac is, is, is going to teach you that. And mm -hmm. these people here don't want to talk about that because some of them oh, like no, homes and uh, uh, I forgot your name. They like to smoke and drink. But uh, they're not going to talk about it. They're not going to dwell on this. But it's so obvious that you people are, are um, uh, uh, you folks here, you know, with, with that body of whiskey, whiskey uh, you don't have any Kerouac's writings or the pages opened up to talk about Kerouac. You have the worst, you've picked up on the worst thing of Kerouac, cigarettes and alcohol. You don't have any of the right. writings in front of you spread to ask questions. So you're really not serious. And you won't understand this until your life has already passed away. And it's not going to do you no good then. Well, Peter, what if I met this chick? She doesn't smoke, she doesn't drink, and I fuck when I get syphilis and I die. I mean, you know, there's so many things that can happen. Or the guy say, hey, Corso, let me drive you to the museum. And the car crashes, bang, bang, slash. Or what if uh, maybe I beat bad pork one night and I go by bad pork? <laughs> I mean, wow. We have a question uh, from a buddy. Go ahead. Could, I haven't been there. So uh, I, I can only talk. Uh, I would. I would rather only talk in relation to Kerouac, on that. Uh, the Ken Kesey and Neil Cassidy came cross country during the '64 election, with a, a vote for Goldwater as a vote for Fun sign on the side of the bus. <laughs> and um, fi I mean, this was their first pilgrimage to New York as as a gang together. And uh, uh, Kesey felt very strong love for Kerouac as well as Burroughs. And so uh, Neil said that he would drive a car out to Northport to get Jack and bring him in to see Kesey and the, and the Merry Pranksters, who uh, were all, uh, at that moment, that evening, high on acid, uh, in an apartment on Park Avenue, which was heavily illuminated with electric, electronic bright lights, cameras going, many tape machines going, wires snaking all over the room, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, ethereal scene, actually, with a lot of heavy metal around and a lot of electronics around. So giving a, a sense of, of a robot uh, re-echoings, ro robot uh, uh, reduplications and mir mirror images receding past into infinity. And um, Neil arrived with uh, Jack, who was brought in from Northport, who was already sick, who didn't want to come out, who didn't want to leave the house, because he knew if he went to the city, he'd be drinking and he'd wind up pain in pain. Uh, brought Jack in the room, and me also. He, got, uh, he sent somebody else downtown to get me from East 2nd Street and bring me up to Park Avenue. So I sat quiet and watched. And everybody was eager to see what Kerouac would um, uh, do in appreciation, or how Kerouac would react to this uh, transposition of on the road into celestial uh, day-glow cosmic uh, electronic uh, environment. Uh, Jack was very shy, uh, sat down on the couch, which was covered with American flags, in, um, uh, but shyly, and removed the flag and folded it up first. He didn't want to sit on the flag of Joe McCarthy. <laughs> it's what it boiled down to. 
But, but he wasn't sure of who everybody was and why they were all there, what they were coming on. So there was an element of uh, bewilderment and confusion in Kerouac. But more than that, like a very deep sorrow, realizing that all of these eager beaver pranksters were going through another stage of uh, uh, dumb show, another stage of uh, idealistic nonsense, another attempt to make themselves real, though they were all made of phantom stuff, and they hadn't yet realized it. And in the course of that, they were poisoning uh, uh, Cassidy with amphetamine, as Jack was poisoning himself with alcohol. So Jack was um, uh, uh, down-mouthed, sad, reflective, uh, unresponsive to all their enthusiasm and uh, uh, actually forced electrical gaiety, brittle gaiety. Uh, the, 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 uh, Kesey was uh, sort of like a very, very beautiful musing angel on the scene because he was observant and trying to understand where Kerouac was. Some of the younger pranksters were, were mocking of Kerouac. What's the matter with him? Why isn't he jumping? Why isn't he enthusiastic? Why isn't he excited? Why isn't he ecstatic? But his ecstasy was in the realization that they were all dead right there on the scene. The scene is still preserved in uh, tape and in um, uh, uh, film. because he was observant and trying to understand where Kerouac was. Some of the younger pranksters were, were mocking of Kerouac. What's the matter with him? Why isn't he jumping? Why isn't he enthusiastic? Why isn't he excited? Why isn't he ecstatic? Well, his ecstasy was in the realization that they were all dead right there on the scene. The scene is still preserved in uh, tape and in um, uh, uh, film. Though uh, so ecstatic were the uh, pranksters that they probably didn't get any of the film uh, in focus, and it was probably all <laughs> jarred and jumping. So the, the visual phenomena might be denied to later generations, but the, it's all recorded on sound tape. And can be, except that they have all the sound tapes jumbled up, and it's never been edited after 10 years already. It still hasn't been edited. So there was that one great meeting, uh, lasting that evening, and then Neil drove Jack back out to Northport. But Neil, at that point, was so jived up with amphetamine that he wasn't really capable of carrying on a um, um, uh, heart tender, mellow conversation with Kerouac. He was laying on Kerouac the story of the cross-country trip. Uh, Kerouac was uh, pained and so because drinking, not able to sit comfortably in the car and was sweating uh, in body. Uh, so he wasn't able to attend with complete tenderness to Neil's condition. <laughs> And they all arrived in this electronic nightmare together. Uh, maybe it's about time that we started to sum up. And uh, if you'd like, I'll, I'll go down the line. And uh, we haven't heard much from you, Stanley. Do you, you want to say a few things about uh, what Jack left you with as a friend, as a person, as a writer? Uh, or what you remember most from your friendship with him in Northport or in the city? Or? Okay. 
I can, I can give you a description of the first time I met Jack Kerouac in Nordport. I did meet him in bars in New York City. I knew he lived in Nordport. I was there before him in Nordport. I moved into Nordport in 56. He came there in 58. I met him at a Cedar Bar. I met him through my painter friends of mine, like Franz Klein. And one Sunday afternoon, I'm walking to my studio on Main Street in Nordport, and there's Jack Kerouac across the street with an old buddy of his. And Jack says, Stashu, come over. We're going to have a few drinks. So we hit the first bar in Nordport. There are about six bars along Main Street. We hit the first bar from, uh, if Peter remembers, Peter's mother lived in Nordport, in fact, at the time. The first bar was near the fire station. Jack Kerouac pulls out a check written out for $5 from his mother. Not the checkbook, just $5. <laughs> that was his money for the afternoon for his drinking spree. We hit every bar, six bars, along Main Street. And the last bar at the waterfront, we hit the bar, we're having our boilermakers. I spent my money, he spent his money. I remember some fishermen looking at Jack, and one of them said to Jack, is you Jack Kerouac? And Jack probably says, yes, I am. He says, I read all your books. They're full of orgies. <laughs> Orgies. 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 Yeah. Orgies. Jack tried to correct him, and I hit Jack. I said, leave him alone. That's beautiful. I think it sounds much better than orgies. <laughs> so I invited the whole gang. I'm here. What have my chair? Right here. <laughs> well, where? Pietro. Oh, I see. I'm talking. So I invited Jack to my studio. I says, I have some bourbon. I have some beer. He invited about six other fishermen, and we had a brawl like you never believed in your life. When I say a brawl, I don't mean fighting. I'm talking about masculinity in a sense, like we're Indian fighting, lake fighting, and so on. One friend of mine landed up on a bottle, broke the bottle across his back. He had like a gash inch and a half down his back. We start stuffing toilet paper up this gash to just stop the flow of blood. Everybody passed out, I think, except Jack and I. And we looked at this scene with the bloody mess all over the floor. <laughs> so I drove him home. I went home. My wife looks at me. She says, what happened to you? You're full of blood. I said, nothing happened to me. I says, it happened to all my friends. Now, this is my first introduction to Jack. All right. Uh I'm dumbfounded. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's, what a it's boring okay. meeting. It's a reminiscing it's a John, John Holmes, John, would, you, would you like to say something in conclusion? I mean, uh, what, I, I don't want to sound too idea. academic, but if you would like to say the discussion around his contribution as a writer I or a person. I just came, folks. I came. Well, there's no that way that, that, <laughs> that I could sum that up. But what I could say when is I that came, I knew him differently than Alan and Bob. And Gregory, for instance, because I knew him as a novelist Which rather than well, a Well, they were rabbi, I got late. <laughs> I learned a great deal from him. I don't believe He was a, a technically much better writer than anyone gives him credit for. No way. He knew an, an no awful way. lot about literature. We about he was minutes. exceptionally That's well read. And as I said before, wonderfully intelligent. His importance to me is, was as a man. He was, uh, I think, the most gentle and tender soul that I'd ever known. Uh, sometimes this was encased in a pretty raucous body, but uh, inside he was pure and beautiful. And uh, you don't meet many people like that, and you value those you do. Thank you. Aaron, would you want to comment, perhaps, uh, if, I, if I lead you in the wrong direction of something you don't want to discuss, but yeah. there seems to be a resentment I against Kerouac in schools. We don't get many courses. Oh, you study literature in college, okay. etc. Okay. Can you explain oh, that? Okay. Would you want to comment on that, perhaps, in a way of concluding? Or? Well, it, it always takes um, any artist a certain amount of time to win any kind of acceptance. So Kerouac was obviously um, very famous in the 50s. Um, there was an inevitable reaction to him in the 60s because every generation sort of hates the one before it. And I think uh, he's going to be restored a whole lot more in the, uh, in 
in the 70s, one thing that academics, as John was saying, don't appreciate is what a craftsman Kerouac was. They think that if he sat down and wrote these things in, in three weeks, uh, wrote on the road in three weeks, you know, that just can't be art. Actually, he started on the road uh, in November of 1948, and he worked on it three years, but he threw away all, all those drafts. He just threw away. So then he finally wrote it in three weeks. But I mean, he could never have done it in three weeks if he hadn't put in the three years before that, trying out all kinds of, uh, of different things that, that didn't work. Alan before was talking about uh, Ken Kesey, and Kesey's metaphor for what Kerouac did, as he said, to his generation, Kesey's generation was this anthill. Everybody's going around doing their work very carefully. And Jack Kerouac was a stick that came along and stirred up the anthill so that suddenly there was all this motion. Uh, and so it was this stirring, Jack Kerouac, this stick that stirred up the anthill that made Kesey want to get on the bus and, and come to New York. And uh, when he had this great meeting with Kerouac, which is virtually the old Kerouac meeting the new Kerouac, Ken Kesey and Jack Kerouac, uh, somebody came up and tied an American flag around Kerouac's neck, and he was, uh, he, he would never call, hardly ever say no to anything, so he let the, the American flag stay there around his neck, but he didn't like it, obviously, and he sits there and he's, he's very unhappy. And Ken Kesey came up to him and was really trying to uh, cheer him up, make him feel better. So Kesey talks to him about, tries to reassure Kerouac that his place in history is, is really secure and really important. And what surprised Kesey, who was much younger in those days, but what really surprised Kesey was that Kerouac completely accepted his place in history, but it didn't help. I mean, he was still unhappy. So, I mean, I think that's, he did know that he'd done something, and yet he was still unhappy. Uh, he'd been the stick- a typical biographer's shot. Okay. Right, you make it, but you're unhappy. I mean, come on, Eric. Aaron? You gotta top that Aaron. baby. Aaron. 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 Aaron, you gotta top it. All right. Right. Aaron, you Thank got you. to top that shot. Charles Jarvis. Don't say that the man had it and was unhappy because he had it. Well, it just didn't help. It didn't mean to help. Do you want to sum up? There's not no reward. But that's what he was saying. That's what he meant. Okay. Alan, um, what about the push cart? When I ripped off the peddler's push cart. I put Jack and his girlfriend in the push cart, <laughs> and I drove it from Greenwich Village to your house on the Lower East Side. And I got mad because you left the yeah, push cart in front of my door. Yeah, because she, Arlene, left her purse in the push cart, so the landlord's worried about the push cart in front of the building. Whose push cart is it? And sees the purse, and sees the address and everything of this person, of Jack's girl, right? You got pissed off, and you said to Jack, do not disturb the normal flow of things of my house. And Jack said, well, fuck you. And he threw the key at you, and he couldn't take the key out of his pocket, right? <laughs> right? I was there yeah, that day. And That's I'm the man who caused it all, but with the push guy ripped off the push cart. <laughs> and we thought it was a terrible thing to rip off a poor bum with his push cart selling right. papers right. or cardboard boxes they used to right. pile it up, or cardboard Somebody's boxes. Right. Somebody's living. Amalgamated uh, shot. Right? Do Amalgamated. You that, Alan? Amalgamated, Al. This is an incident. You guys are interrupting me, but I'll, you can. This is an incident in Subterraneans. You're very conspicuous. Really? I don't know. It's not a boring story at all. That push cart. Same thing about my story. Alan? The push cart is not like boring at all. Anything, the push cart. Uh, man, like going through New York City with the nights out, the stars right. out, Carrack and his girl no, riding through the venture. night. Okay. And a push no, cart. No, I just. Just. Uh, there is a tape. It's all uh, boring. Gregory, excuse me. There's a tape that Jack made a lot of tapes, of course. And there is a tape that I've heard where he's trying to reminisce about his childhood. And he says that um, he wanted to be uh, a great athlete, which he was, really. He wanted to be a great scholar, which I think he was. And he wanted experience. He mentions people like Jack London you know, in his early days. All I've got to say is I think he did it all. Really. It was possible. I think Jack did it. Yeah, he did. He did. You know, but one thing he didn't do, he tried to lay words on me, and I wouldn't take it. All right. uh, See, I know language very well. And he met his peer. And he met the peer and his friend in Columbia. But I didn't go to Columbia. I went to prison. I threw Al here. I met Jackie and Bill Bowes, a whole shot. Okay. But I came with my credentials. All right. 
we have a uh, uh, wine and hors d'oeuvres in the A and B. I'd like to have one A and B left. Hallelujah. I'm, okay. All right. And before we break, before we break, I want to thank the people who are on the panel: Charles Javis, Aaron Latham, John Holmes, right. Alan Ginsburg, Stanley and, Twitter, which Greg and Greg Grosso, and, and Peter Olofsky. And I think Wait, it would be before very you fitting, go. One thing. It'd be very fitting before we How go. How you doing, samples? To have, I would like for uh, Alan to close with something. Oh, wait, I'm going to close it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, that's agreed. I could just let, let, me, let me say one thing. Alan, you can have it. All right, let me have it open, open, though. Yeah. Is it open? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's all right. Your mic's <laughs> uh, Your question was really important. 